15 minute or less lecture series, Anatomy and Physiology, Chapter 14, Lymphatic System and Immunity, Part 1. The lymphatic system has a variety of functions, including collecting and carrying excess fluid from surrounding tissue or interstitial space, uh, transporting dietary fats to the cardiovascular system via lacteals in the small intestine, and defending against disease, especially the specific immune response. So we'll start with the transporting fluids. It all starts in the tissues with the lymphatic capillaries. Lymphatic capillaries are tiny closed tubes within the interstitial spaces around the tissues, often near where cap blood capillaries are. And what happens is that when blood, uh, fluids leave the blood capillaries, not all of the fluids return to the blood capillaries. And over time, fluid pressure, hydrostatic pressure, builds up around the tissues. And when it gets high enough, it'll allow for that excess fluid to enter the lymphatic capillaries. Uh, the lymphatic cap Capillaries are basically just simple squamous cells that are slightly overlapping. So when they get pushed in by the pressure, the fluid enters lymphatic capillaries and is now called lymph. Lymph from the fluid capillaries will then uh, move, migrate into the lymphatic vessels, which are fused into the capillaries. The vessels become bigger and bigger. They uh, have valves, semilunar valves, very similar to in veins, inside veins. So it has the three little cups that can prevent the lymph from backflowing. Uh, lymphatic vessels that are larger end up passing through structures called lymph nodes, where the lymph fluid is filtered and screened for any pathogens. From here, the lymph vessels will eventually fuse into nine of the one of nine of the large lymphatic trunks that are draining different regions of the body. And finally, those trunks will fuse to form either the thoracic duct that drains three fourths of the body, or the right lymphatic duct, which drains the upper right quadrant of the body. Both of these ducts will then uh, empty the lymph fluid into the subclavian vein, so it is now returned to the uh, cardiovascular system. So lymph capillaries carry blood to afferent lymphatic vessels, which go through lymph nodes, which then exit via efferent lymphatic vessels. It'll pass through many, many lymph nodes until eventually the lymph vessels fuse into lymphatic trunks, which then become the collecting ducts, either the right lymphatic duct or the thoracic duct, and then the subclavian vein. So again, lymph vessels are working under super low pressure, so they have to take advantage of the same mechanisms as veins do. So they get squeezed by the contract contractions of skeletal muscles to send the fluid toward the subclavian veins, and they also get squeezed by the changes in pressures from breathing in and the thoracic and abdominal cavities. If for some reason, there's an abnormal increase in interstitial volume. It can lead to edema. So this can be caused by excess filtration of fluids from the capillaries of the bloodstream, or inefficient absorption of, from the lymph capillaries, or some sort of blockage among the lymph vessels. And as you can see, the edema can be quite dramatic and significant. All right, there are also various organs and tissues that are important for the immune functions of the lymphatic system. Um, and in these tissues, you will find lymphocytes, macrophages, and yeah, other cells. And they tend to be localized in high concentrations around areas where pathogens might be able to enter the body. So lymphatic tissues are found in many, many of our organs, uh, such as the small intestine, the large intestine, the bronchioles, the urinary bladder, and so on and so on. And these tissues found in these organs are referred to as MALT, or mucosa-associated lymphatic tissue because they're near the surface, the open area that organ forms. And they are unencapsulated, they're rather diffuse, and they're found as part of these other organs. Uh, specific structures that are only in the lymphatic system include the tonsils, uh, the appendix, and the pyrus patches. So in these areas, you have what are called lymph nodules. They're not quite organs, because they're only made up of lymphatic tissue but they are very important. They possess lymphocytes, macrophages, et cetera. So the tonsils up in the pharyngeal area, you have the pyres patches, the lymph nodules found around the small intestine, and then a lot of lymph nodes found around the appendix. So again, areas where pathogens can be a problem. The tonsils include the one single pharyngeal tonsil in the upper back of the pharynx, the two right and left palatine tonsils, as you can see down here, and the two lingual tonsils. And these are, again, lymph nodules. And obviously, many pathogens can enter the body through our nasal cavity or our oral cavity. 
And here the palatine tonsils are inflamed because they are fighting some sort of pathogen. The, next are the lymph nodes. Lymph nodes are little filtering structures found along the lymph vessels. They fluid the, uh, filter the lymph fluid multiple times as it travels through the lymph vessels. However, they are found in higher concentrations in areas such as the groin and the armpits and in the neck. And again, they contain lymphocytes and macrophages checking and surveilling for pathogens and they also have a filtering purpose to remove any cell debris found in the lymph fluid. Here's a lymph node that would be found in the body. Here's a cross-section of one with the afferent lymphatic vessels arriving with the lymph fluid and the efferent lymphatic vessels carrying out exiting with the fluid and you have the uh, various macrophages and t-cells checking for um, pathogens and also mesh-like structures of the reticular fibers to help filter the lymph fluid. Lymph nodes can often swell and get tender when they're fighting infections. So if there's a localized infection near that lymph node, so here you can see this bump from someone's uh, lymph nodes in the neck getting swollen. Next up is the red bone marrow. Bo red bone marrow is considered part of the lymphatic system because it is where the lymphocytes are produced. So you get immature T lymphocytes produced in the red bone marrow that then leave for the thymus to mature. And the B lymphocytes, the mature B lymphocytes are produced in the red bone marrow. Also produced are another lymphocyte called natural killer cells. The immature T lymphocytes arrive into the thymus, which is found in the uh, thoracic cavity, slightly above or superior to the heart behind the sternum. And it has various connective tissues and a capsule that divides it into lobules. And in here, it allows for the maturation of the T lymphocytes. Um, this is caused by the secretion of certain hormones, thymocins and thymocoidin, that then cause the T lymphocytes to properly mature. Next up is the spleen. Here we see the spleen. It is in the upper left abdominal uh, region of the abdominal cavity, slightly inferior to the diaphragm and uh, lateral to the stomach. It is the largest lymphatic organ. Um, it is somewhat similar in structure to lymph nodes in that it has a lot of reticular fibers and a mesh-like structure for filtering out things. But in this case, it is working on the blood. The spleen filters and screens the blood itself. So it has white pulp. These little spots are the white pulp. that contain many lymphocytes and are important for the specific immune response, screening for pathogens. And then the red pulp, which contains uh, many erythrocytes and macrophages and is primarily focused on removing old erythrocytes, old red blood cells from the bloodstream. Uh, ruptured spleen, if you get hit in the region of the, the spleen, it can become damaged and hemorrhage. And if this is significant enough, it may need to be treated by a splenectomy, causing a removal of the entire spleen. This happens, uh, the person's overall immune response function is reduced. And there's tonsillitis. If there's persistent infection or inflammation of the tonsils, or it's occurring again and then again and then again, uh, they may decide to remove the tonsils. Um, and this would be called a tonsillectomy. And overall, there's no notice reduction in the immune response if the tonsils are removed. All right, immune response, defense against infection. There are various pathogens out there that to infect our body to eat us because we are delicious. There are various viruses, such as influenza, the flu, the cold viruses, Ebola, Zika virus. There are various bacteria that can cause infections, causing strep throat, gonorrhea, botulism, cholera. There are protozoans, individual cells that are similar to our own cells. that can cause things like malaria, sleeping sickness, giardia. And then we can even be infected by little animals called worms, tapeworms, pinworms, hookworms, heartworms, all kinds of fun stuff we love moving into our bodies. We have two main lines of defense against these pathogen, pathogens. There's the innate defenses. These are nonspecific. They'll guard against any pathogen. And they're either really, really swift or just always present. With species resistance, mechanical barriers, chemical barriers, natural killer cells, inflammation, phagocytosis, and fever. And then there's the adaptive defenses or specific defenses. They target one specific pathogen and try to take that one pathogen out. There's a slower response that has to get built up and primarily involves lymphocytes. So pathogen gains entrance to the body. First line of defense is to stop it before it completely gets into the body. This is the skin, mucous membranes. If the pathogen gets through that, then the second line of defense is all these other things, chemical barriers, natural killer cells, et cetera, that we're going to talk about. And then, of course, uh, there is the third line of defense, which is specific immune response. So 
First line of defense, species resistance. Turns out many pathogens cannot infect us because we are not the right species. Our metabolic uh, characteristics are not what the pathogen needs to survive. Uh, mechanical barriers, the skin, the mucous membrane, they can prevent entry of pathogens. Hair, mucus, tears, and sweat also can act as mechanical barriers, washing away or preventing the pathogens from entering. Uh, then there are the chemical barriers, for instance, the high acidity of the gastric juices in the stomach, that's a chemical barrier. The lysozymes, the enzymes in the tears and saliva that attack pathogens, they are a chemical barrier. Uh, we also have interferons, these are hormone peptides where an infected cell releases the interferons to warn neighboring cells that there is a pathogen afoot, especially viruses are afoot. And so the neighboring cells that detect these interferons then produce antiviral enzymes to protect themselves. And they also stimulate natural killer cells that will destroy the infected cells. Uh, we also can activate the chemicals in the bloodstream called complement. Uh, they will fall out, not fall out, but precipitate out and attack the uh, bacteria, they will trigger uh, and stimulate inflammation. They will attract uh, neutrophils and macrophages to fight the infections. And they can even cascade out of the bloodstream and form holes in the membranes of bacteria, destroying the bacteria. Natural killer cells are specialized lymphocytes that look for abnormal cells of our body. They will destroy cells that are infected by pathogens, especially viruses. And they also can destroy cancer cells. Um, they do this by releasing these proteins called trephorins that poke holes into the um, cells and help to destroy them. They also enhance inflammation and are being used in research to fight cancer. Uh, inflammation. Inflammation is characterized by redness, swelling, heat, and pain. Basically, when you have an injury, that area will become inflamed because we're probably going to have uh, pathogens enter through that injury. Uh, blood vessels will dilate, increasing blood flow, increasing volume of blood in that area, causing swelling, causing the redness, causing the heat, and some pain. Uh, white blood cells will then enter the area to attack any pathogens, to clean up any cell debris. There will be blood clotting to stop the loss of blood. And then eventually fibroblasts may arrive, and if the infection is ongoing, they will produce a, a con uh, connective tissue structure around the site of infection to try to isolate it. Phagocytosis, that's neutrophils and macrophages engulfing pathogens, viruses that have been bound to antibodies, things like that, and also any extra cell debris. Fevers, powerful protection, where our body decides to raise our body temperature to interfere with bacterial growth. It's also reduce the amount of iron in the blood, which means less nutrients for the pathogens. And actually, our phagocytic cells work better, even greater uh, function at a higher temperature. However, if your fever gets to be 104 degrees or higher, seek medical attention. That is it for this part of the lecture.